All righty. Um, today, and let's to put the syllabus up, um, today is our last day of class, and I had asked you to do, um, to do a little bit of an internet search project uh, to try to locate hate speech uh, online. And I had mentioned one of the reasons for this last time is that uh, the web is a very important uh, source of information that all of us use nowadays. Um, obviously, this information is constantly growing at an exponential rate. There's no way that any one person can possibly uh, have an overview of the tremendous number of voices and ways in which the web is very much part of a participatory information ecosystem, one which is constantly changing. And certainly, one of the interesting, I think, exciting things about the web, and this is especially the case in countries where it's not regulated, um, is the possibilities of free speech. Um, this is another forum for free expression and free speech. And these types of forums, I believe, personally, should not be censored. They should be um, actively cultivated. And uh, it's part of the very foundation of what makes our democracy work, is that people can protest, people can speak their minds, people can express opinions that may be contrary to public opinion, or perhaps even opinions that are unsavory, controversial, opinions of a minority. Um, but I think there's also a distinction, and this is where I wanted to start today, between uh, free speech and what would be called hate speech. And um, the definition of hate speech um, is a kind of speech that incites people to violence. Um, this is different than speech which is protected as free speech, because free speech is an expression of an opinion, uh, a point of view. And it can, like I said, it can be completely unpopular. It can be an opinion that most people don't hold on to. It can be controversial. Um, free speech in the United States Protects people, from, protects people to deny the Holocaust. That's perfectly acceptable under the terms of free speech. Uh, as unsavory or as difficult as we may find that to be, um, it's a protected right that we have in the United States, and it can be expressed in any forum, whether it's in newsprint, uh, in articles, in films, on the web, and so forth. There's a professor at Northwestern University. He's a tenured professor of engineering uh, who's written a very... Um, to my mind, a uh, terribly distaste, distasteful and controversial book called the hoax, of the, 21st, the hoax of the 20th Century, which basically is a book denying the Holocaust. Uh, he's a tenured professor at Northwestern. Northwestern's a top-tier university. Uh, he can't be fired, uh, at least because the way in which his um, merits are evaluated is based upon uh, the fact that he's a civil engineer. His promotions are connected, in fact, to his work in civil engineering. And as a pastime, he writes uh, revisionist articles denying the Holocaust and supporting a very, uh, to my mind, very right-wing, white supremacist agenda, uh, which also allies itself with other types of racial um, hatred. Um, this is protected speech. Uh, it's, uh, it's protected, again, because it's freedom of expression. The question is, when the speech crosses a line. That is to say, when this speech becomes something else is when it becomes hate speech. And hate speech is something that incites people to physical violence. It may be mob violence. It may be violence uh, that uh, is, um, is meant to inflict bodily harm on the group of people who are being uh, targeted. Um, I'll give you an example of what I consider to be hate speech uh, recently. Um, do you know about the controversy at uh, the University of California, San Diego, uh, with regard to uh, the hostilities against uh, African-American students? Um, hanging a noose in the library at the University of California, San Diego. Um, is it a speech act? Is it hate speech? Is it freedom of expression? Um, to my mind, it's hate speech. And the reason why is because it's a symbol, uh, not only a symbol of a very dark period in our nation's history, a symbol of lynching, a symbol of uh, racial violence, but insofar as you hang something in, a, I think, a place of learning, you're also potentially inciting people not only to remember the history of this violence, the lynching, but potentially incite people to, um, to violence in the present. Um, hate speech doesn't actually have to be speech that is written or text. It doesn't have to be words. It can be symbols. Um, swastikas can be hate speech, uh, especially when they're carved on the door of, say, um, a Jewish student union or the Hillel or someone's dorm room. 
uh, that would be hate speech because it specifically targets a person's identity and it calls upon a history of hatred that itself is allied with violence. Um, this is why I think a noose uh, is an example of, of hate speech. Um, certainly this is contested. It will be contested in law. Is it an innocent thing to hang a noose? Uh, is it not? Is it innocent to hang a, you know, put a swastika on a Jewish student's dorm or not? Um, you know, where does, the, where does the line blur between freedom of expression, I'm free to do things, I'm free to express myself, and speech which is meant to incite violence? And uh, certainly the borders between free speech and hate speech are ones which are, which are very contested. And, um, and it's something that I, you know, I wanted you to begin to look into by looking online and seeing if you could find examples of uh, essentially racism, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and so forth. Um, a number of you did. Uh, a number of you sent me links uh, to things you had found. Others, I'm assuming, had found things and uh, you didn't have to send it to me by any means. Um, but I'm wondering uh, if anyone feels comfortable speaking up about anything that you did uncover. Um, how easy was it to find uh, Holocaust revisionism or denial? Was it easy? Was it hard? What did people say? What are, what are they, what are they put publishing online? Interesting. Yeah, well, just to repeat what you said, that I hadn't heard about this. I don't know about this particular case. Uh, the city of Glendale has, is it, are they actually swastikas that are in, embalmed in the bottom of the light? And were they meant to be swastikas in terms of the intention of when they were constructed? They were. Yeah, so I mean, it's, then that's an example of where I think it's specifically citing that uh, history and making, I think, a very you know, present day kind of connection, which is potentially you know, a kind of approval uh, insofar as it, it stays there. Um, and that to me, I think, yeah, that's where, again, you, know, you take a historical symbol like a noose. Uh, it doesn't ostensibly mean anything, you know, unless you understand the history. Uh, again, you can't, I don't think that you can claim ignorance to, to these things. I don't think you can say, I don't know what a swastika means. I don't know what a noose means. Um, I believe that uh, certainly in a context of an educational system or in uh, so far as you represent or someone represents a city, um, these symbols are not innocent or free uh, or neutral. Um, so, yeah. There you go. The official website of David Duke. Um, so, yeah, this is, I mean, maybe you've heard of David Duke, uh, a well-known uh, KKK activist. Um, and, uh, again, books and documents that are protected under free speech. Um, and, and, I, and I agree they should be. Um, but I also agree that uh, as part of a civil society, it's also our role to understand and educate people about uh, history. And that's part of what the class is about. And it's also, I believe, one of the ways that uh, free speech is actually protected is by denying people a platform to speak their free speech. Uh, meaning, I don't have to publish this book, um, I don't have to promote it, and I don't have to give him a podium to speak, um, I don't have to link to it. And there's all kinds of ways that I can, within the context of protecting free speech, actually allow someone like David Duke not to be able to define the discourse of the day. Um, and I think that's actually a way that you can sort of have both. And it's an important thing. I mean, I think it's, a, it's always, it becomes, a, I think, a very, it becomes a difficult situation to understand why we need to protect free speech as the foundation of a democratic society, and especially protection of speech which is controversial, and at the same time wanting to make sure it doesn't go to that line of becoming hate speech or inciting violence. Um, you know, within Germany, for example, just to give you a, an example of a, um, another way of dealing with this, this kind of uh, publication would be illegal. Uh, you could be arrested and put in jail for it because in Germany it's illegal to deny the Holocaust and, uh, and texts like this, uh, I imagine, do exactly that. Uh, it's specifically illegal. That is not a position that you can have publicly in Germany. You cannot deny the Holocaust. In the United States, you can. Uh, it falls within our protections of free speech. Uh, Jacob? I found it interesting. I found it a forum to discuss the pictures from Holocaust, mm -hmm. and they were actually claiming that they are edited, that people are added to the pictures, or kind of photos. They're not in the picture. They are cut off. Mm -hmm. They came in a picture with a soldier aiming at a woman with a child. Right. Mm-hmm.
So basically, I mean, a site that is specifically focused on looking at historical photographs and other footage and trying to point out uh, that this stuff is, or making the argument this stuff's made up, uh, that it's, uh, that it's false, falsified and so forth, which is pretty common. I mean, this is, uh, there's stuff from, there's sites from, that deal with Claude Lanzmann's film Shoah, uh, which basically try to debunk uh, all of the testimony that's in there. Um, it's set up in order to say that, you know, this is just made up. Lanzmann made up Shoah. The people who are in there made up their testimony. Um, the photographs we've seen are made up uh, and so forth. I mean, this is fairly extensive. Um, there's a, a site that one of the students brought our attention to called uh, hiddenmysteries.org, uh, which is uncovering uh, conspiracies. Uh, they call themselves Holocaust uh, whistleblowers. And the idea is uh, they particularly deal with the Swiss banks case. I thought this was interesting. Um, they're not only blowing the whistle on what they consider to be false claims uh, that, the, that anyone actually suffered anything, but uh, have a tremendous amount of, um, I think, very disparaging quotations, basically saying that uh, all the, basically, the Swiss banks case is unfair to Switzerland. It's basically present-day Jews trying to defraud Switzerland of money. Uh, that is to say, essentially, it's an anti-Semitic stereotype that comes back again. It's just that, aha, the Jews just want money. Um, so it's, uh, it's troubling, given the fact that, as we talked about last time, the Nazis looted all the assets that they looted, all of the assets that they stole from people, as well as money that Jews themselves put into Swiss banks for safekeeping before they were killed, was maintained in the Swiss banks for decades. They earned interest on this money. They benefited by this money. And only out of a class action lawsuit did they reluctantly agree to make a settlement of $1.25 billion uh, to victim groups um, in order not to have to actually pay more by having to go through the actual lawsuit. Uh, this was a settlement before you know, the lawsuit uh, actually you know, happened. Um, this is, uh, I mean, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, all this stuff is, is deeply, uh, deeply troubling, but uh, it's often under the response of, um, of history, of uncovering history, of revising history, um, and there's, there's you know, entire sites dedicated to this. I'll give you a, another example real quick. Um, this is uh, the professor at Northwestern University, Arthur Butts, uh, who's uh, tenured, as I said, uh, author of The Hoax of the 21st Century, uh, many articles on Holocaust revisionism. Uh, most recently, um, he was asked to, to comment on the Iranian president's remarks on denying the Holocaust, which he uh, obviously supported. He talks about how all the documents of the Holocaust are basically forgeries, that this was a, a Jewish... Uh, essentially a Jewish conspiracy, uh, that it was basically uh, made up, uh, that the Holocaust is something that you have to believe in, like sort of like you believe in, um, yeah, uh, it, it's something that's not based on evidence, it's based on uh, belief. Um, so, other examples? There was a... Germany is not the only country where that type of thing is prosecuted. That's right. Not off the top of my head, I don't, no. No, Germany is, is not the only country where denying the Holocaust is illegal. Um, but I think it's, it's significant that it is such a widely cited and known law in Germany, given that one of the, this is just another way of trying to you know, make good in some ways on, on the past. Um, but there's, uh, there's, I don't know how many offhand, honestly. It would be interesting to know. Yeah, other? Have you read the book? The Hoax of the 20th, 20th Century? Yeah. No, I haven't. No. I was wondering, like, how would these people answer for knowing people that still just, like, disappeared? Like, if they weren't killed by the Nazis, what would have happened to them? You know what I mean? Like, I don't understand how any of this is even... Yeah. Anyone can read it. I right. Well, it's available for download here, um, and, uh, and one can do it. So, um... Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, at the same time that, you know, you might find it despicable and disgusting, at the same time, you, you might want to actually look at it and understand, you know, what are the arguments that they make. I mean, in the class that we've taught, you know, we've looked at Nazi propaganda before. We look at the Eternal Jew film, and that's the only bit of propaganda that we looked at. But in some ways, it might make sense, actually, to kind of bookend the class by looking at present-day propaganda, uh, which is, you know, stuff like this, which comes from, you know, pretty, um, I mean, a professor at Northwestern University is not uh, insignificant. 
and, uh, and he's well known as, uh, as one among many uh, revisionists. Um, there's a, what is the name of the society that he works with? Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, you can get overviews about, about this and also learn, yeah, this is the, the most, this is the most famous uh, publication, the Institute for Historical Review. Um, and in, insofar as even you call it an institute for historical review, there's a certain amount of, like, it sounds legitimate. It's an institute. You know, it's a think tank. Uh, and what are they doing? They're doing historical review. Well, that sounds good. One should do review of history. Uh, and how do they, they have a library, they have an archive, they have a journal, they have conferences, they have books online, audio archives. I mean, you're making use of the whole range of, uh, of you know, web-based, uh, you know, resources. I mean, you have a tremendous amount of stuff, support us and so forth. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, they're not only anti-Semitic, they're often, you know, they're often explicit in their uh, racism. They're also, they tend to be very much allied with uh, ideas about white supremacy, ideas about purity, ideas about, you know, our nation is suffering, being contaminated by the Jewish lobby or the African-American lobby or whatever it may be. Um, so... In any case, yeah, what's, uh, what's so amazing, again, I think, is just how well they utilize the resources of the web to disseminate uh, their ideas. Um, yeah, books uh, and so forth. Yeah. So, and, it's, and many times this stuff looks, uh, you know, to call a book, you know, Hitler's War, this appears to be on some level legitimate, but uh, the point of view that it's coming from is actually um, very supportive and not, uh, and not in any way... Um, you know, negative. Yeah, so here's the, you know, the, the facts and figures on Auschwitz according to the Institute for Historical Review. Um, you know, on fake gas chamber. Each year for decades, tens of thousands of visitors to Auschwitz have been shown in an execution gas chamber, in quotes, in the main camp supposed by its original state. In January 95, the prestigious French weekly magazine Express acknowledge that everything about this gas chamber is false and that it is, in fact, a deceitful post-war reconstruction. Um, they go on to talk about the bizarre tales, the uh, Rudolf Hess, uh, the com commandant at Auschwitz, um, just uh, explaining that this wasn't a place where people were killed, um, that this was, uh, it was just uh, an innocent enough work camp. The story of Anne Frank is, is false. It's allied propaganda. The survivor testimony is, is uh, made up. So, I mean, you can... You see how extensive and, and pervasive it is. Um, other examples that people found, or anything else they wanted to, to share? Yeah? Um, no, not, no, no. I mean, I mean, to what extent, I don't know. I mean, can most of the books be found in normal bookstores? You can certainly get them all online. And, uh, you know, I don't know to what extent uh, we at UCLA or other universities have these books. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm kind of a, of, a, of a conflicted mind as to whether we should have them. On the one hand, uh, we need to know that this kind of, um, you know, information exists out there. On the other hand, I would hate for that to be a resource that people use as, uh, as authentic or correct uh, and, uh, and reliable. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to figure out how to deal with it. And this goes back to you know, a very fundamental question, is just how we evaluate uh, these kind of sources, how we understand the political, uh, the very, I mean, sometimes very subconscious, sometimes very overt uh, political, racial reasons that make up these arguments. Um, and, and often, they're, they're, they're really not very, um, they're not very obscure at all. Um, I don't think you would find them at Barnes & Noble, though. Um, again, I haven't checked, but I suspect that we probably have some, yeah, I, I suspect so. And I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. Again, I think that um, part of the burden becomes placed on us to evaluate these sources. And also, again, it's not so much prohibiting people from saying these things, but it's uh, also figuring out how you, I think really how you think about the ways in which this information is disseminated and, and how it's taken seriously or not. And that's really, I think, the role of us as educators and, uh, and you as, 
as young educators uh, who've gone through, have examined this material, who've looked at it and seen it, you know, from so many different angles. You know, at some point, it's it's not just incontestable. It's uh, it's really it's absurd and, and truly um, vicious to you know write things like this. I mean, it's um, it's simply it's not simply this. I mean, it's, of course, it's not true to fact, but it's beyond that uh, because it's also motivated by such uh, such deep uh, and unexamined perhaps uh, hatreds. So you know that's why I think this line between hate speech and free speech is is really quite blurry. Yeah. Other thoughts or issues, things you have found. In any case, I I mean I'm not going to encourage you to read this stuff, but I think I would encourage you to know that it exists and that it's quite pervasive, and I think it's becoming more and more pervasive because of the web and because of the ease in which information can be uh, accessed and disseminated. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's worth knowing that this exists out there. Alrighty, we'll do that later. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk uh, today just very, this is the lecture part, very briefly. Um, and it's a little bit of a change of, uh, a tiny bit of a change of scenery. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, three memorials in Berlin. And this will actually be the last lecture. This will last maybe just a few minutes. But I want to say something about the way the Holocaust is remembered in uh, the capital of Germany. Uh, since um, one of the bookends to this class is we know that the Wannsee Conference took place uh, outside of Berlin. This was the moment where the authorization for the final solution uh, on January 20th, 1942 took place. And Berlin, as the capital of uh, reunified Germany, um, has also been at the forefront of designing memorials and museums uh, that deal with the Holocaust in a very frank and open and, I think, um, sophisticated and serious way. And the three memorials I want to talk about are, uh, are these. Um, one by um, an American architect named Peter Eisenman and uh, a very large Holocaust memorial that just opened in 2005 in Berlin. The second is a museum uh, by an American Polish um, Jewish architect named Daniel Liebeskind. Um, and it's a Jewish museum that opened in 2000. And then uh, a smaller and somewhat more, uh, a significantly more le less known memorial, but I think in many ways extremely compelling, uh, by um, a team named Renata Stich and, and Friedrich Schnock uh, and uh, their uh, Bavarian Quarter Museum, which is sometimes just called the Signs. And these three are all in Berlin, and uh, I think that's important because, like, like I said, Berlin was the place uh, where the Wannsee Conference happened. It was the, where Hitler thought of making the capital of the world if he had succeeded. It's where all the major mm, SS and Gestapo headquarters were. It's where the chancellor was situated, and as you also know, uh, just outside of, um, outside of Berlin was uh, one of the major concentration camps, Sachsenhausen, uh, where um, more than, uh, more than 150,000 people were taken, um, many of whom perished, and a significant number of experiments that happened on gay prisoners uh, took place. Um, so these are the, the memorials. I'm going to start with, um, uh, with actually Peter Eisenman's. And this is the, um, this is the Hypercity site that I had showed you before. And uh, this site, uh, you can look at this if you want. It's just hypercities.com. And there's a number of cities that we're working on just providing historical material about the different layers uh, of these cities. And some of these is through maps, others through other kinds of information. Um, the monument, um, if you know Berlin at all, there's a couple interesting things. One is uh, there's a, a big gate right here called the Brandenburg Gate. Um, this is their capital building, the Reichstag. Um, the Berlin Wall used to run right here. And uh, this right here is the memorial, um, this thing here. And I'll zoom into it from Google just so you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, it's uh, basically a grid of, uh, of columns. And I'll maybe turn the lights down so you get a better view. Um, it's a grid of columns uh, that rise from the ground. And the closer you get in Google, the more it becomes just like that, uh, kind of this undifferentiated field of um, cement columns. And this was unveiled in 2005 um, as the Germany's Holocaust uh, Memorial. Now, 
that's kind of, it, on, ostensibly, it's kind of strange as a Holocaust memorial. For one thing, I mean, this kind of strange, grid-like, somewhat rationalized, um, also conceptual type of memorial. You know, why would cement columns signify the Holocaust, uh, especially a grid of cement columns like this? Um, you know, it's surrounded by streets, so you can see cars on the one side, and it's, it's a big thing. I mean, just to give you a sense, that's a, that's a car size. So these, these columns are almost the size of a car. Um, and they're equally spaced uh, so that someone can walk in between them. And as it goes, what happens is the columns are very low to the ground on the outside here, so maybe just a few inches or a few feet above the ground. And as you go deeper into the memorial, like as you walk inside of it, and so you walk between these columns, you actually are kind of overcome by the memorial. Let us say the columns are higher than you. They become about 10 to 12 feet high, and so they're higher than most, you know, all, well, almost all human beings, and uh, you're kind of lost in some ways among the memorial. In any case, um, this is a kind of uh, not a typical memorial in some ways because you wouldn't necessarily know it's to the Holocaust unless you read some of the plaques and information about it. And uh, it's really more of an experience, I would say, than it is um, something that's commemorating the names of, of the victims. Um, in Germany, there was a lot of debate as to what the format of this memorial should take. Like, how does one make a memorial to the Holocaust? Um, and one thing that was cited as an example was the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in the United States, which is, has the names of all the fallen soldiers inscribed in it, right? There's some 50,000 names of soldiers who lost their lives uh, in that war. And so an analog was thought about. Well, why don't we create a memorial that would have all the names of six million, perhaps more, you know, given if you want to include other victim groups besides Jews, which would make sense. Um, you have many millions of names that would have to be inscribed. The problem is that the amount of land that they had for this memorial, which although quite large, um, this is a, a one very large city block, if you had inscribed all the names, they would have had to be only a few millimeters high in order to actually all fit because there's simply so many names. So unlike the Vietnam Veterans Memorial where there are 50,000 names and you can read them and you can make impressions, to make a Holocaust memorial on this particular spot of land with six plus million names would have really made the names pretty much illegible. And there's another problem, which is that many names weren't known. Uh, although the Nazis kept good records, although we have victim books uh, that exist that the Nazis put together as well as through post-war research by historians, um, not all the names of the victims are known. And so that would have been another uh, issue. Another question is you know, how to organize the names. Uh, alphabetically, or well, what happens when you find other names? Um, another you know, big problem. Uh, so they decided that it wouldn't make sense to have a kind of direct memorial of the victims' names, and they ended up going for something which was significantly more conceptual. Um, conceptual in the sense that uh, what Eisenman was proposing is an experience that people don't look at the memorial and kind of like say read the names but actually have to enter the memorial they have to walk inside of it and so what you do literally is you park on the side of the street and you there's an information center right here and you walk inside the memorial and as you walk you are surrounded by these uh, columns these columns uh, I'll show you Eisenman in the memorial let's say um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, so that's, a, that's, that's the ar architect, Peter Eisenman. And the memorial, as you can see, is beginning to kind of envelop him. Uh, and as he goes deeper into the memorial, the columns become higher and higher up. Um, it's space such that a wheelchair can fit between the memorial, uh, between the columns. So that's the, the spacing was specifically to accommodate uh, someone in a wheelchair. And um, the idea was that as you enter in further and further into the memorial, you become a little bit more off kilter. Uh, you become a little disoriented. Uh, you can only see like a sliver of the sky. You see like the outside. And uh, Eisenman also made it such that all the columns are actually leaning slightly. They're not completely perpendicular, but in fact, they're all leaning one or two degrees. And so there's this kind of sense of vertigo, a sort of sense of uh, dizziness as one goes into the memorial. And Part of it was to create this experience of claustrophobia, of being off kilter, of being off center, a sense of uh, kind of not being entirely at home. Uh, it's not the way that one walks down a street, um, but in fact, you're kind of overcome by this experience of being almost trapped, although you know the exit, so you can run out of the memorial if you need to be, but this sense of actually being overcome by something. Um, it's actually pretty effective. Um, and you know, when I visited it, 
in 2005 when they were installing it, um, you know, I, I was struck by the fact that, one, it's very large, and second, it does have this sense of enveloping you, a sense of being enveloped by the, by the concrete. The other thing I think is really interesting about this memorial, and just I'll point this out, um, is the closeness of the memorial to the Capitol. Uh, that's the Brandenburg Gate, uh, which you may know. Actually, I think I can put this on Earth view. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't come up in 3D, but that's the, this very famous uh, gate to the city called the Brandenburg Gate. Um, many of you probably have seen this before. Um, let me see if it'll come up. I'll put it on 3D. There you go. That's the Brandenburg Gate. Um, so that's the city gate to Berlin. Um, if you sort of pan around here, you can see the Reichstag, which is Germany's capital, which is there. Um, that's the Capitol building. And the memorial is located a stone's throw away from both of these. The memorial is just down the street. It's literally, if you just sort of turn around, uh, you'll come to the memorial, which is just outside of the, the garden here. Let me go back to the satellite view, because it's a little easier to navigate. Um, so we got over there, but anyways, that was the gate, that's the Capitol building, that's the memorial. Um, they're very close. Um, and this was, I think, this is very powerful because one sense, this was uh, land that Helmut Kohl had allocated in 1992 to the Holocaust Memorial, and it was only built in 2005, or only unveiled in 2005, it was built the year before that. But it's a sense of saying that something very fundamental about Germany and the capital of, New Ger of Germany, of Berlin, is connected to the Holocaust. That is to say, it's not something on the outside, something we're going to put off to the side of the city or in some other city. We're going to build it in the city center of Berlin. And we're going to build it essentially next to the two most famous buildings in Berlin, being the Brandenburg Gate right there and the Reichstag right there. This proximity between these three, I think, really indicates something about the centrality of the Holocaust to German national memory and identity at this period of time. Um, it's also interesting that this is, uh, you might know, this was the street uh, Wilhelmstrasse, where Hitler had all the major bunker, uh, had his bunker over here, and also the Reich Chancellery as well as the Gestapo headquarters were located on this street. So it's a very symbolic street as well for Nazi power. This is the seat of power in 1933 to 1945 Germany. Nazi Germany was on this street. The memorial is right next to it. Uh, the memorial, in fact, even covers some of the land that was part of one of the Nazi ministries and one of the former bunkers that were used by the Nazis in the last days of the war. So, you know, reclaiming this ground, reclaiming this history is, I think, a very central part of what uh, this memorial was, was trying to do. All right. Um, let me... Scoot down just a tiny bit uh, here and see if I can uh, yeah, locate the Jewish Museum. Um, there it is. So this is um, a museum that's a little bit more on the outskirts uh, of Berlin, but uh, a really interesting structure. And from the sky, it's uh, terribly interesting because you can see it's this uh, lightning bolt. That's a, that's a museum. Um, it's a very odd structure uh, for a building, first of all, because, well, it's not exactly, um, doesn't exactly look like a building, right? I mean, it looks, like, uh, it looks like a building that's been sliced apart into many different pieces. And uh, I think this might exist in, in Earth view as well, and you might be able to see it from the side. Yeah, there you go. That's nice. Um, so it's next to another building, which is the German History Museum here. This uh, lightning bolt structure is the uh, Jewish Museum. And when you're in Earth view, it makes it slightly harder to navigate. But let's see if I can change the orientation real quick here. There you go. Ah, so you can see it from the side. Um, these two buildings, the German History Museum here and the Jewish History Museum, are connected. Uh, they're connected underground. Um, in fact, one goes into the Jewish History Museum by entering the German History Museum. And so symbolically, there's some idea that German history and Jewish history are fundamentally bound to each other, connected in, in a deep way. On the surface, they're separated. Uh, the buildings are not touching each other. But on the underground, one enters this building, one takes a stairway, and then emerges in the top in this Jewish history museum, which has four floors and uh, consists of the structure here, as you may have recognized, is kind of a fractured uh, Star of David. So it's uh, a, a, you know, two triangles um, imposed on each other, but broken apart. Um, and the idea here is that the building is in many ways cut apart, broken, 
it's composed of these lines which um, have certain continuities but also certain fractures uh, to give you a sense of uh, the connection and disconnection between Jewish history and German history. So as you walk through this museum, you have a sense of this kind of deep cutting apart and reassembly of German and Jewish history. Um, it's a very powerful experience, and all of these lines uh, in the building actually extend out uh, into the city to mark uh, parts, places where Jewish victims actually lived uh, in, in Berlin, and also connotes through its symbolism the idea that German history and Jewish history are both you know, in tension, but also in some ways fundamentally um, bound together. I don't know if anyone's ever, has anyone ever been there by chance? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's a remarkable structure. I mean, a few of you have been there. Um, I recommend it very highly, um, because not just because of the architectural innovation, but also because of you know, the knowledge that you have of uh, German uh, and Jewish history. So we'll go back to the satellite view. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, the, that's the structure there. All right. Um, so there's one other um, thing I want to talk about, one other um, memorial. And uh, these are also, these are, like I said, they're all in Berlin. And I think the fact that they're all in Berlin is important. Um, there was another proposal. Actually, there were 528 uh, other proposals uh, for the major Holocaust uh, memorial. So this, uh, this memorial that won out was one among many other, hundreds of other entries that people had put in. And um, some of the ent entries were things like, you know, inscribing all the names of the victims, um, the entry by this uh, artist team, Renate Stich and Friedrich Schnock, was actually quite interesting. They had proposed that you wouldn't build a memorial at all, but in fact, the memorial that you should build to the Jews, uh, to the Holocaust, would actually be a bus stop. And they thought that the buses would leave from the Brandenburg Gate, so this very famous gate, this entry point to, to Berlin, and you would take buses to the concentration camps. So you could take a bus to Auschwitz or Ravensbrück or Buchenwald or Sachsenhausen, Dachau and so forth. And there would be a schedule. There would be a schedule posted out there of when the buses left and when they came back. And the whole memorial would, rather than being a site where people would visit, it would actually take you to the real historical sites scattered throughout Germany, Poland, Austria uh, and so forth. Um, it's a fascinating idea. And actually, I think, very compelling, um, because the idea is not so much uh, to have this almost, uh, I would say, kind of a, a somewhat fake experience in the sense of being decentered or off, you know, off kilter by going into the memorial. And that's maybe a critical way of understanding what Eisenman was trying to do. But actually going to the real physical sites and going to these camps, um, almost all of which still exist. All the major ones certainly do. There are uh, memorials today, um, and so many of these camps also still have uh, aspects of the barracks or crematoria left, and the evidence is important for people to, the physical evidence is important for you to see. So that was their argument. Um, in any case, this particular memorial wasn't chosen. Instead, Eisenman's was chosen, and perhaps, you know, this at least makes more sense as a somewhat more conventional memorial. But uh, they did create a memorial uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Berlin. And that's the, the last one which I want to share with you. Um, and this is it's kind of a strange memorial. And this is in part of West Berlin uh, called the Bavarian Quarter, uh, which is in uh, the western part of Berlin, a little bit south of the, um, of the Tiergarten. And the idea behind their memorial um, is actually to look at this. It's actually a series of street signs. And the street signs look like this. Um, they're attached to light poles. And they're in German. And what they say are laws that the Nazis had created um, during the 1930s and 40s, um, particularly anti-Semitic laws. So for example, this one says, treatment by Jewish doctors will no longer be covered by insurance companies. And the date here is March. The, remember, the month is 2nd. So it's March 31st, 1933. That was the law uh, of the land in that year. And so the memorial consists of uh, the wording on the one side of the law. And on the other side, there's a picture. On the other side of the, the, of the sign, there's a little picture which may reference something like a, a doctor. Um, and underneath of it is a little um, an insignia saying this is part of a memorial um, for the victims of, of the Holocaust and the 6,000 Jews that used to live in this predominantly Jewish neighborhood uh, in, in Berlin. So there's... Um, 
a number of these. They're actually, I'm not sure the exact number off the top of my head right now, but there's approximately 100 of them. And I plotted some of them uh, using Google Maps here so you could sort of see where they are. Um, and I'll give you other examples. This one, the only German films are to be made by Germans of German descent. Um, that's a street sign from 1933 as well. Um, go down a little bit more. Jews are forbidden from joining city choirs. Um, so some of these things are completely like everyday weird laws, right? Like they, they impact everyday life. They're not really necessarily terribly vicious in themselves, um, but they impact you know, sort of the way in which people could live in Nazi Germany, in that society. You can't join a singing choir. You can't be a doctor. Um, one law is you can't buy milk. Uh, Jews are forbidden for buying milk. Um, Jews are not allowed to go to the Wannsee Beach, which is where the Wannsee Conference took place, is that nice beach that was now off limits to Jews um, on the, on, in 1933. Uh, the German Automobile Club will not allow any Jews to join, also 1933. Uh, Jewish actors and actresses may no longer perform, 1934. Jewish art and antiques dealers are no longer allowed to practice their profession, 1935. So this kind of this ongoing, uh, this ongoing assault on everyday life about what Jews can and can't do. Um, and really the, the tremendous everyday aspect. Jewish authors may no longer write in Germany. Um, an amazing thing. You can no longer write in Germany. Um, Jewish musicians are forbidden, 1935. Jewish children are not allowed to walk in groups of more than 20 people. Um, park benches become off limits to Jews. Um, Jewish veterinarians are forbidden. Um, journalists and their spouses must prove their Aryan descent back to 1800. Uh, so something that affects this is after the Nuremberg Laws. So you had to, if you're going to be a journalist, you had to prove your Aryan. Um, Jews are forbidden to earn PhDs. Postal workers married to Jews must quit, uh, affect an intermarriage ban. Jews may not join the German Red Cross. Jews may no longer enter some parts of Berlin, so places that are on 1938, places that are off limits. Um, swimming pools in Berlin are forbidden for Jews, 1938. Sounds like um, the race laws that we had also in the United States. Jews must disclose their financial information to make sure it's in the interest of the German people. Uh, Jewish doctors may no longer practice. In any case, these laws go on and on. There's, there's uh, literally, there were hundreds of laws like these. Many of these laws become part of this memorial. And the idea is a kind of everyday connection of these memorials. The sense of you begin to walk around the city and it has this sense of you read the law as it existed in 1933 and you sort of reflect on the present. You reflect on, wow, it's not the law of the day anymore, but it has this profoundly uh, disconcerting effect to think that was the law of the land just decades earlier. The last point I want to make, and this is where I'll end the lecture today, um, is the very last law that the Nazis enacted. Um, and this is these laws, 1938, they continue to make these laws, 1940, 42, 43, 44, 45, I unfortunately don't have the sign for this particular law, but it's, it's quite um, powerful. Um, this is the law that they made uh, in April of 1945. So this is just before the defeat of Nazi Germany. It says, uh, all files with anti-Semitic content are to be destroyed. Uh, April 1945. Now that's a pretty amazing last law, right? This is the last law that the Nazis came up with. It's not so much about you know, what you're going to do to prevent Jews from living their lives in Berlin or wherever else, but it's basically a law that says we're going to destroy the evidence of anything we just did. Uh, basically, all files, all information about everything we just did in the last 12 years is to be destroyed. Um, in German, it's Achten der Gegenstand anti-Jüdischer Tätigkeiten sind sind zu vernichten. Um, this word is really important. It says that all laws with uh, anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic content are to be annihilated, not just destroyed. And you might remember from the first um, lecture, I'll remind you, let's see, this term. It's the same exact term that Hitler had used to describe uh, what he was going to do uh, in 1939 
to describe the genocide. So remember, they didn't use the word Holocaust, they didn't use the word Shoah, they didn't use the word genocide. They used the word Vernichten or Vernichtung, uh, meaning annihilation, to annihilate. So Vernichten. Uh, who speaks of the Armenian genocide, Vernichtung, today? The Vernichtung, the Jewish and Rasa Europas, uh, the destruction, the annihilation. And in the memorial, it's the same thing. This is the very last law they come up with, is that we're going to annihilate all the evidence of what just happened. Um, it's an extraordinary thing, right? Essentially, it's the it's a imposition of silence and erasure of history. The very last laws the Nazis came up with was to erase their own history. Luckily, um, that didn't happen. All right. So, um, good. Well, that's uh, we've reached the end, and um, so. Thank you for your participation.